yes, we have a, a very slightly shorter um, lecture today because I will have to leave uh, at a quarter past sharp uh, due to another meeting that was pre-scheduled. I hope you all had an enjoyable uh, colloquium. It sounded really interesting. Unfortunately, I couldn't uh, fit it in my time. Oh. But um, welcome back to uh, probabilistic modeling and Bayesian inference or introduction to probabilistic modeling and Bayesian inference. And today we are going to move on to what is really the cornerstone of all supervised learning. And it's a, a technique called a linear regression. And so um, before we start in earnest, uh, does anyone have uh, questions on probabilistic PCA or the earlier computations with, uh, with Gaussians and so on? Because the, um, you will see that they are quite relevant to today's lecture. So regression is uh, the main supervised learning task of learning a function. Yeah, so we have data, data, unlike uh, what we were seeing in modeling directly distributions where the data are uh, all the same in some sense, here data is made up of pairs, which traditionally we would call X and Y. And the task is from multiple instances of x and y with i equals one to say big N, learn a function that predicts y from oh. x. Uh, Matteo, is there a problem? Uh, uh, Matteo, I think you're unmuted. Uh, so, learn a function. And the term regression uh, comes from the, the Latin for uh, stepping back, walking back. And in fact, it means from trying to trace back the origins of the variability in an output variable that we're interested in, trace it back to its sources, which come from the input variable. And typically we will focus on the situation where y is a scalar, while x might be, well, is in general a vector in d dimensions. So linear regression, so this is a general regression form formulation. Linear regression is the special case where regression means that f of x is an affine function. So it's the weights vector. This is called the weights times the input variables, scalar product, plus a bias term. And sometimes uh, this gets uh, rewritten well, usually it gets rewritten in this form, w hat transpose x hat, where now w hat is made up of w a vector and b is a concatenation of these and x hat is x and one. Okay, so in this way, uh, basically by augmenting our input space and by convention making the last component always equal to one, we can rewrite, we can get rid of this bias term. Now, the probabilistic formulation, so linear regression would just be of this form, yeah, would be y, uh, y scalar equals W transpose. Okay. The probabilistic formulation would 
assume a noise model. So the output is not just a linear transformation of the input, but it's a linear transformation plus noise. And um, if we wish probabilistic, linear regression, has the formulation y equals w. And I'll forget the hat now. Uh, I'll just assume that you are all familiar with hats that are just a notation, plus epsilon uh, y is a scalar, so it doesn't need a squiggle underneath, where epsilon is a noise term with a noise variance, sigma squared. So now compare this with probabilistic PCA. Okay, if you recall, probabilistic PCA was saying that Y, now let's say PPCA instead, we had that vector Y, high dimensional vector Y, was a Tolson matrix times a latent variable X plus epsilon. So you immediately see the strong similarity between the two. In particular, if y in PPCA was um, you know, one dimensional, it would formally look exactly the same. But let's note two important differences. Yeah? OK, so the first one is that PPCA is a dimensionality reduction technique. Yeah, and that means that typically uh, the dimension in PPCA, the dimension of Y is greater than the dimension of X. While in linear regression, opposite. Generally, we try to explain a one-dimensional scalar output in terms of a number of input variables. But the main, main difference in PPCA, x is a latent variable. While in linear regression, x is observed. Okay. And so that means that uh, we are looking at a, a very, very different setup. So here is, let's say, PPCA versus linear regression. Okay, in both cases, if we plot the joint space, uh, let's say, so in PPCA, well, in PPCA, we'll be looking at, say, a two-dimensional y, Yeah, which we try to explain with a one dimensional X. That would be PPCA. Yeah? So this would be W X, W would be a two by one matrix and X would be a one dimensional thing. And here there would be a bias as well. So this is the PPCA picture. And notice PPCA can also be recovered as a, a least squares problem. In fact, the original PCA was a least squares problem. And you would find the hyperplane or the, or the uh, low dimensional subspace such that the orthogonal, the sum of the orthogonal projections would be minimal. Instead, in linear regression, 
linear regression. We have an X variable and a Y variable. And we might still have a cloud of points that we're trying to fit with a line. But this time, if you see, you know, the error term is just in the epsilon, in the Y direction. Yeah? So the, the least squares problem, if you wish, would be to minimize the sum of the vertical distances of the points from the regression line. So it's a different setup, it's totally different, but it's different. And so, you know, last comment about PPCA. The reason why there are no errors, why the errors go only in the vertical direction in linear regression is because the X values are precisely observed. There is no noise whatsoever on the X values. We are conditioning on them. So many times when I talk, for example, with biologists and I talk a lot with biologists, so people that have a little bit of um, a statistical background, but not a very deep one, they would try to do linear regression because that's what people know. And they would say, but I also have uncertainties on the input variables. Well, if you do have uncertainty in the input variables, you just can't do it in linear regression. What you need to do is to consider the joint variability in Y and in the output and the input and do a probabilistic PCA, okay? Now back to linear regression and the nitty gritty of linear regression. So we'll kind of, uh, if I can wake up my pen, yeah. So rest of today, uh, we'll do some calculations. Are there some questions here before I start the calculations on the differences between linear regression and PPCA? They look very similar, I agree with you. So I, I see no, uh, I mean, if you have any questions, just put it in the chat. I don't think, let's see if I, no, there is nothing in the chat, so I guess I can be relatively safe. So let's start first with uh, um, the maximum likelihood solution. So before doing anything basic. Okay, so I have that my outputs, yi is going to be a weights vector times the input plus an error term and the epsilon i uh, are all drawn from this Gaussian independently and identically distributed. So the, uh, the likelihood function as a function of W, P of Y, uh, let's, let, let's denote as capital Y. So let's say capital Y is equal to Y1 up to Yn and capital X is X1. So this would be a matrix and this would be a vector. Yeah? So capital Y conditioned on capital X and the weight vector and the noise variance. Well, since they are IID, then this factorizes as a product and I will have a product of P of I. one to n. 
P of Y I given X I W sigma squared. And these are all Gaussian terms. So it will be a product of, uh, well, there is going to be a normalization constant. one over uh, square root two pi sigma squared. Uh, but that's, that's fine. And then I have an exponential minus a half xi minus, uh, sorry, yi minus w transpose xi squared. And now it's a product of exponentials. Uh, so it would be the exponential of the product. I will get this to the power n. Sum of all of these terms. So now we can take, we normally proceed by taking the log and the log likelihood which is a function of W and sigma squared. It will be N minus N log sigma squared to the one half that comes from this term here. Okay, I take the log, I get a minus because it's a denominator, I get an n, and then I get log sigma, sigma squared, square root of sigma squared, which is a half log of sigma squared. And I'm going to get minus a sum with the one half in terms of, in front of it, sum for i equals one to capital N of uh, yi minus w transpose xi squared. Okay. And now plus a constant, yeah? So I'm shoving in here all the various two pi's to the power n over two or whatever, yeah? So to find the maximum likelihood, I need to uh, differentiate with respect to uh, W and sigma first. Okay, and I have to differentiate this uh, square. Well, I get a minus a half the sum And then the, uh, that's, that's the derivative. So I get a two and then I have to do, differentiate these and I get a minus which cancels with that minus. Xi. So this is the gradient, okay? And if I solve it, by setting it equal to zero to find the maximum likelihood solution and use my matrix, um, my matrix um, formulation of big Y and big X, I will get that um, uh, will have to be equal to Uh, y and y times x. And so I get that w, I have to, to transpose uh, both sides. So I uh, will get 
So if I transpose these, uh, I have to transpose and change uh, the ordering. I get x transpose x w equals x transpose x. OK. Now, uh, sorry, transpose here. Now notice this inverse, OK? This is the inverse of a matrix. And this matrix is made up by taking the product of two matrices that are made up of stacking n vectors. <coughs> so in general, the rank of this matrix is going to be the bigger between D and N. No, the smaller between D and N, yeah? But this is a D by D matrix. And so if N is smaller than D, it will not be invertible, yeah? So this is invertible only if um, the number of points is greater than the number of dimensions. Yeah? So this is the standard thing. You, you know, if you don't have enough observations, you will not be able to constrain a hyperplane. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You need at least as many observations as dimensions to constrain a hyperplane. Um, it's in machine learning is also called overfitting. So it's telling us that the uh, optimal solution will go through the data points exactly, and that will uh, uh, return a degenerate uh, solution. Yeah. So this is the, the overfitting case. You need to have at least as many observations as the number of data points. OK, any questions on the calculations for the mean of logistic regression? Maximum likelihood, uh, so no, I shouldn't say the mean, the maximum likelihood solution for the weights of logistic regression. I can't see anything flashing up in the chat, uh, which is a bit surprising because you used to be incredibly communicative until last week. I don't know what happened during the weekend. Uh, <laughs> hopefully nothing too dramatic to uh, silence you all. Anyway, so assuming this is all clear, then uh, we can compute, so this gate, Equating this gradient to zero gives us the maximum likelihood estimate for W. Uh, what about the maximum likelihood estimate for sigma? We need to compute the other derivative. With respect to sigma squared. And obviously here, I forgot to divide by sigma squared, which doesn't matter here because it, um, you know, it's a constant in this, in this equation. Uh, so the W solution does not depend on sigma squared. So if I differentiate that now, I will get uh, um, an N over two times one over sigma squared with a minus sign that comes from differentiating the logarithm And then I will get a plus, well, I get a minus, let's say, sum uh, one half sum of yi minus w transpose x i squared. Derivative of one over sigma squared with respect to sigma squared is minus one over sigma to the fourth. I set this to zero. I multiply everything by sigma to the fourth, and I get that um, 
n sigma squared has to be equal to the sum over i of y i minus w transpose x squared. Now there is some beauty to this formula, which naturally implies that sigma squared is the whole thing divided by n. Because what does it tell us? Well, you, you have to look at the residual. So how wrong you were. So if you have found your optimal weights w, which you can do because the optimal weights do not depend on, um, on, uh, or, or, on sigma squared. If you have found your optimal weights w, then you're not going to go exactly through the data, but you will have a little error, a residual. Yeah, you take that, you square it, and you take the average of those, and that is your maximum likelihood estimate of the regression variance. So it's the average of the square deviation from the regression line. Okay, this is all, all, all makes sense. Does anyone want to ask? Uh, um, excuse I, me. Yes. Uh, in the previous section, sorry to ask it late, um, I couldn't find out what is the relation between the invertibility of the matrix um, with the number of points and dimension. Yeah, 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 good, good point. You see, X, so this matrix, X transpose X, which we need to invert, is obtained by multiplying these two matrices X. Yeah? And this matrix X is obtained by stacking N input vectors, yeah? Uh -huh. So uh, its rank is going to be uh, the bigger between D and uh, the smaller between D and N, yeah? Because you're taking N vectors and you're constructing a matrix by exterior products like this, yeah? So um, if, you, if you consider what is the rank of this uh, matrix, what is the number of non-zero eigenvalues, it's going to be the smaller between N and D, okay? Um, you told now this is a D. Oh, sorry. Uh, you told that no, this no. matrix is a D by D, um, dimension x uh, yeah yeah so because y is uh, uh, an um, an n vector yeah uh, and so x is uh, n vector again in the previous slide uh, no x is a, uh, is a, 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 x is an n by d matrix x transpose uh -huh, n by d, d. I see, by I see. n matrix and so you get a D by one thing, and this is a D by D thing. I see. And if N is smaller than D, the, the rank of this will be N. So the rank of this thing will be the bigger between N and the smaller between N and D. Mm -hmm. So if this object has got rank N, which is smaller than D, then you can't invert it. Or well, you can do a pseudo inverse, yeah, but, but this, Lack of invertibility is what signals that it's a degenerate um, model, which means simply that there are an infinite number of ways in which you can actually go through the data exactly. So you can make, you can maximize this likelihood and, and go exactly through the points. And what is worse, what will happen afterwards, if you go exactly through the points, all of these will be zero. Yeah, and you will find uh, a, likely, uh, uh, um, a maximum likelihood estimate of sigma squared, which is zero, which obviously doesn't make any sense because that's a variance. Uh, but what it signals is that the, if you put a zero here or here, well, here it would be zero divided by zero, but if you put a zero here, you're going to get an infinite likelihood. Yeah. 
And so that is the, the hallmark of overfitting. So this is a mathematical bit of overfitting. Overfitting is when you can go through the data perfectly. Now in the neural networks community, and you might hear some of these, I don't know if you will hear anything on neural networks in this course, in this spring college, they tend to think overfitting as a lack of generalization capability. So you predict very, very well, but then you predict terribly on points that you've not seen before. But in the linear case, this is the, the kind of neater definition, in my opinion, that you actually get an infinite likelihood at maximum likelihood. So you've got an unbounded function to optimize. So I saw a new question, Michele. Uh, does this calculation differ from PPCAs? Uh, well, so this calculation differs from PPCAs uh, precisely because we condition over X. So if you had someone that told you, hey, I can tell you what the X values are in PPCA, then this would be the same calculation, except that, of course, the output variables in PPCA are higher dimensional in general. Yeah? So these are the two differences. Uh, in PPCA, um, the target variable, the ambient variables, the, the, the Ys, if you wish, how we call them, are high dimensional and the X are low dimensional. And in PPCA, the X are unobserved latent variables associated one with each observed high dimensional point. And in linear regression, they are observed, and so you always just condition. So you see our, our, our likelihood, our objective function is a conditional, while the likelihood for finding W matrix in PPCA was a marginal. Okay, one more question. Okay, but the higher dimension is just the absence of the invertibility request on X. No, uh, no, no. Uh, so you can have situations where your Y target is uh, not just one dimensional. Yeah? So this would be called uh, uh, multi output regression. The, the invertibility simply stems on the fact, I mean, so for example, you could take if you had a Y that was higher dimensional and Epsilon now needs to also be a higher dimensional, Epsilon was diagonal, then the problem would decouple into a bunch of lower dimensional problems, linear, one dimensional linear regressions. Yeah? And you would have exactly the same problem with the invertibility of X. Okay, any more questions on uh, the maximum likelihood of, of linear regression. Yes, one more. Oh, okay, you're welcome. Uh, ah, no, there is another one. Uh, Inva, can we say the probability is not the same thing because the likelihood refers to finding the best distribution of the data given a particular value of some feature. Um, so the likelihood, uh, you see, the likelihood is a probability distribution on the data. So you see that the likelihood is a conditional distribution of the output given the inputs and the parameters. But when you optimize it to find parameters, you view it as a function of the parameters. And it's not a probability of the parameters, it's a function of the parameters. Yeah, so it's not normalized in W or, or, or anything. Oh, by the way, here I should have. Uh, I should have the sigma squared here, I forgot it. Um. Yeah, so you see, it's not a function, it's a function of sigma squared. It's not a probability of sigma squared. And it's a function of W. It's not a probability on W, even though because of the very special form, 
it will look very much like a probability on W. Now, to make it a probability on W, we need to move to the Bayesian setup, which we will do now, very briefly. So in fact, if you want to be Bayesian on linear regression, the standard way to do that is to uh, place a prior on the weight. So the Bayesian linear regression still has the same conditional uh, distribution, P of Y given uh, X, W and sigma squared is still a Gaussian with mean W transposed X and variance sigma squared. But then you typically will place a prior distribution over the weights. And the canonical choice is to uh, have another Gaussian, Gaussian with zero mean and a spherical variance. Okay. Now, this is now a setup that we've encountered a few times, so I'm going to leave it as an exercise. compute the posterior distribution over the weights given the observations and the variance sigma squared and the parameter alpha squared. You can also place a prior over sigma squared in the form of an inverse gamma and it will work. The uh, solution to this is uh, just another application of the calculations that we've been doing many times with Gaussians now. The reason why it is very important though to do this is because it allows us to introduce the concept of Bayesian model averaging. Which is a central concept in Bayesian inference. So the idea is now, okay, I have learned my um, posterior distribution over the weights given a training data set and some hyperparameters. So what should I predict for uh, Y star associated with a new input X star? So what, how would you do predictions? Well, in the ML world, in the maximum likelihood world, maximum likelihood estimation world, you would take the maximum likelihood estimate of the weights and return Y star equals W transposed MLE. X star. Let's put the input stars at all. So what you would just do is a plug and play. Yeah, you would say, okay, I found my W once and for all, and I would ju just use that value. In the Bayesian world, Excuse me, what about the noise in the maximum likelihood? Yeah, because in prediction, you see, sure, you, you, if you were to give draws, then you would add a little bit of noise. But if you ask, what is my expected value of Y? 
then the expectation of the noise is zero. Yeah. So you would just plug the new input into the linear formula. Okay. But in the Bayesian world, you would consider the noise and not just the noise in the observation, but you would work out what is the probability of y star given x tilde star and the data, the training data. And obviously these various things. So how would we do that? Well, we would apply Bayes' theorem Now stop conditioning on the hyperparameters. Well, by the marginalization rule, this will be um, the uh, average of P of Y star. You see, if I know W, so if I'm conditioning on W, then there is no dependence of the new Y on the previous Ys. It's all summarized through the posterior distribution of W. So this is what is called Bayesian model averaging. Because you see, this is the model your linear regression model, and it depends on W. But W is not just one value. W has got its own probability law, which is this posterior, which is trained on the training data. So you don't have only one value. You have a whole distribution of possible values. And Bayesian model averaging averages out the, mod the predictions of all the models in this ensemble using the posterior. So going back to our little pictures, MLE, this is a training data, would fit a single line, and then it would predict for a new X, it would predict something here. This is MLE. Bayesian, given roughly the same data, we say, well, there are many, many possible lines that go through here, each with its own probability. And then when it comes to X star, it will say, well, there is a whole distribution which is somewhere here. It's got mean that is likely to be exactly the same and will be exactly the same as the maximum likelihood prediction, but it also quantifies its uncertainty. So this is base. Now I saw there were a couple of questions flashing up, which we'll address in, in right now. Uh, can you go to the slide before? Yes, of course I can go to the slide before. Yeah. So all I'm saying is that maximum likelihood, you content yourself with a single value and that's it. You use it for all your predictions. Yeah. Professor, I have a question. Yeah, yeah please. Um, the probability of W provided the data points, uh, does it depend on uh, sigma square? Yeah, it does. I have, uh, um, I've, I said that I would omit it. It will depend on sigma square and also on the ah, okay. prior. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this one depends on sigma squared, and this also depends on sigma squared. Yeah, I just didn't want to keep conditioning on huge sets. Okay, any more questions in the last uh, minus one minutes?
I, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, as you say, the babies uh, using Bayesian give us a ring, a uh, spectrum of Ws, right? Uh, distribu the distribution of W. Then how does it affect the uh, test data? Yeah, it affects which the test data because... The, which one of the Ws should be, does it use for the prediction? It uses all of them. It averages them out in this way. So the prediction is done by computing an integral. If you prefer to do a sampling way of a Monte Carlo approximation of this integral, which you would have to do in many complicated cases, but in this case, you can do it analytically, then you would be drawing W values according to this posterior and, and draw a bunch of lines, and then you will get a histogram of your possible test outputs. Doesn't it make it hard for us to know which one is better? You know, you, you get ah. the average. It's, uh, you see, it's almost a philosophical shift. There is no such thing as better. There isn't a single answer. I think I'm actually quite convinced that in most scientific setups, there isn't a single answer. There are, there is always some uncertainty. And what Bayes does is to quantify your uncertainty and say, look, my belief on the outcome is not a single point, but it's distributed somewhat. Gives you confidence of where the answer may like, lie. But the Bayesian philosophy moves away from a single best or better answer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, sorry. So would the two uh, regression coincide in the, uh, for a large number of samples? Uh, well, so that's an interesting uh, question. You see, because we are looking at at the, the linear setup, and this is something we'll, we, we'll see later, yeah? With more samples, uh, provided that the model is correct, yeah? Then the uncertainty over the Ws will reduce, you're absolutely right. So you will get lines that are more similar. But still, if you move far away from the data, those lines will diverge and you will still get a, a sizable uncertainty. And that is to some extent the right thing because if you are far from the um, data that you've observed in your training, you shouldn't give an answer you're very confident of. But yeah, in, in that case, so the, the posterior variance will shrink, uh, but you, you would see that, you know, this uncertainty here will depend also on how far you are. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And with this, I'm going to stop for today and I shall see you again uh, tomorrow. Take care. Bye, Matteo. Ciao. Thank you very much, uh, Guido. Uh, see you tomorrow.